And we can do this very intellectually, but we can also do it quite emotionally. And if you allow yourself during this discussion to connect emotionally to the teachings of reincarnation that are on earth, and then allow yourself to feel the emotions that get generated in the people who believe in these beliefs on earth and in the spirit world, you will start seeing how many negative, fearful emotions are created by this belief. Now, like every other belief that's on earth, there's obviously often a combination of truth and error in the belief. So, for instance, many Christian religions have in them a combination of truth, some truths that are very true, and also some error-based beliefs. Many other religions, the Buddhist faith, the Hindu faith, the, all of the other faiths that you could name, in fact, the New Age movement and many of the other types, of, even the scientific movement, all have teachings of truth in them. But they also have false beliefs. And the problem that we all face throughout our progression in, towards God is how to weed out the false from the true. Can you see that that's going to be an issue, isn't it, in our lives if we want to get to God? The way to weed it out is very simple. Ask yourself, is this loving? That's the only question, actually that you need to consistently ask yourself about any belief. Now, we could say that some of the, some of the answers to that question are, it's love neutral. In other words, it doesn't seem loving or unloving. I don't really know. What you do with those kind of beliefs is you just put them on the shelf and wait until you get some confirmation either way. Then you'll find that there's a whole other set of beliefs that you can quite easily see where the love is or where there is no love. And in those kind of things, you can weed out, even in any single belief that's on earth, quite easily you can weed out where the love exists and where the love isn't. And then you can start making decisions about that. Well, we know God is a God of love, so therefore it's highly likely this loving perspective is probably true, and this other perspective that doesn't seem very loving there's something wrong with it. Now, with everyone that doesn't seem loving, there is two possible answers with that as well. One is that your perspective is actually skewed. In other words, you think things are loving that aren't loving, and you think things that aren't loving are loving. Right? And that's a possibility too, isn't it? That I could, with all the emotional injuries and baggage that I have, I could have within me this emotion that thinks something's loving when it's not, and vice versa, think, think something is not loving when it is. Yes. So, how many of us in the past have said, oh, you know, I don't always tell the truth because it seems harsh? How many of you have felt that in your life? Yeah, quite a lot, right? Now, now, that sounds like a loving sort of statement, doesn't it? Like, not to be harsh. Like, you know, obviously, we all have the interpretation that being harsh is unloving. Right? But then to allocate truth to being harsh, that's where we make that mistake, you see. And so now we say truth is harsh, therefore truth must be unloving. You see where we go with it? When in reality, the truth sets people free, so the truth is always loving. And we've forgotten that because of our emotional damage. So the key thing to bear in mind in all of this discussion we have today about reincarnation is to look at the results of the beliefs. To look at what the beliefs bring mankind in terms of just general results. Because beliefs that bring mankind into a state of a lack of love or cause harm to mankind in some way cannot be based around truth. But we're talking about it from God's perspective again, not from our own, because our own perspective is often skewed towards not understanding love. Mm -hmm. So we're all right with the basis of this discussion. Yes. All right. So let's look at some of the beliefs, if you like, what I would call false reincarnation beliefs, and let's look at them from the point of view of love. Now you have it, you have the list there. 
And what, what I'll get you to do, maybe, is if, if you just yell out the first belief, and then we'll look at it. So, yell out the first belief. Palmer, <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever you sow, you shall reap, is paid during many lifetimes. Okay, karma is paid through many lifetimes. You've heard this, right? Yes. In other words, here's you. If you're a female. <laughs> and you lived a life, so let's call that your life. Then you passed. You went to the spirit world. So you're now in the spirit world. What normally does most reincarnation beliefs say at that point? A bit of a life review whatever and then to progress you have to come back to earth as another person and the reason why you have to is because you have karma or law of compensation I would call it or we could call it what you sow you reap in other words you sow some nasties and so you're going to reap some nasties now that get imposed upon this lifetime but there's only a few snags with it. One snag is that you can't remember what you did. You follow me? So that makes it pretty hard, doesn't it? Like, how do you deal with karma from a previous lifetime that you can't remember you had? Well, that's why you've got to keep coming back. That's why you've got to keep going. <laughs> Endlessly. Endlessly. Now, can you see already, if we understand the soul too, we're already we can start seeing that if I had karma from a previous lifetime and I reincarnate, that karma will affect the law of attraction in my current lifetime, which will even cause more law of attraction events, which I may make choices about that are disharmonious with love. And so the next time I come, I could actually be in a much worse condition. Now there are some beliefs on earth that say that actually I end up like an ant. <laughs> Sorry, that's meant to be an ant. Um, because of the choices that I made in the previous lifetime. Right. Where do you go from there? Where do you go from being an ant? <laughs> Amoeba. On, only up. <laughs> only up. Okay. Right. Now, let's look at the love in this process. Let's look at this now from a parent's perspective. Right. So what we're really saying from a parent's perspective is, little, little, little what's her name? Little Sally, right? Little Sally did some wrong things. She made some wrong choices. Why did she make them? It wasn't her fault, was it? It's because of her parents or whatever. But anyway, she made some wrong choices, right? She made some wrong choices. So what I'm going to do now is face her up to those choices in the spirit world and then send her back to correct those choices. But I'm not going to tell her what they were. <laughs> now, does that sound very fair to you? Does that sound loving to you? Can you see what's going on there? If it was, it, wouldn't the loving thing be to tell you? Or that you've got a record of them inside of you that you can connect to and release? That you know, yeah, last life I did this, last life I did that, last life I was a mini dancer and, you know, like, this is the choices that I made. I decided that I'd go to... It would be great to remember it, wouldn't it? If you're going to deal with the karma, you need to remember it. Isn't that not true? Yeah, isn't, isn't the whole philosophical basis behind that that God isn't a separate soul? So, um, so therefore, you know, when you say it wouldn't be loving from God's point of view, they don't even, those people don't even see it from that perspective, so... For some, God isn't a separate soul at all. No, that's right. But if we, God, for some, God is just fragmented into you. In other words, we're all God. But we're all bits of God. What's everything? Yeah. Well, yeah, even, even animals, plants and everything are all God as well. Yeah. Right. So God, in other words, under those circumstances, is not an entity. So that's a very Buddhist viewpoint. Whereas a more Hindu viewpoint is... That, that God is an entity, a separate entity, and we are separate entities that go through the cycle of life. But the, the, pro, the concept of, of not being loving is only relevant if there's a being to be loving, isn't it? If God's everything, then 
who cares whether it's loving or not? It's just the way it is. I mean, isn't, doesn't that follow? Yeah, that's right. See, what's happened with a lot of these beliefs is we've come up with ways of justifying pain. Can you see that? So one good way of justifying pain is to say, oh, there's no such thing as pain. Actually, it's all just all part of the same thing. But quite often you hear like, you know, pain and pleasure, it's just all the one thing. Does it feel like the one thing to you? No, it's funny that, isn't it? It doesn't feel like the one thing, but we say it anyway. It helps. So what happens a lot of times is we tell ourselves messages, which we then come to believe so that we can explain to ourselves why we're in so much pain and suffering. But what actually happens with that? Our pain and suffering often doesn't alleviate all of our entire life. And uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, even as a spirit often doesn't alleviate because of these beliefs. And so in the end, these belief systems are unloving in themselves. They are actually damaging your own viewpoint of yourself, your own viewpoint of others, and your own viewpoint of the universe. Right? And anything that does that is not harmonious with love. So, can you see how it all works? We can get very philosophical here, right? Which I don't want to really do. But we can get very philosophical and, and by the way, I just need to point out too, there's lots of spirits who have come for this discussion. Um, so, um, it's one reason why I'm feeling a bit hot again. Um, there's lots of spirits who have come to this discussion because they believe in reincarnation, but they are feeling locked up in the belief. They, they can't reincarnate onto Earth. They know they can't. They don't understand why. They feel they have to reincarnate onto Earth to progress, but they don't understand why they're not progressing and reincarnating on Earth and so forth. So there's quite a number of spirits who have been brought here for this discussion as well. So I'll address things from a spirit perspective at times and from a person on Earth's perspective at times. But looking at this whole process firstly, is it loving to stop the person from knowing what they've done wrong? It's not loving, is it? Particularly if you're expecting them to correct it in the next existence. So why would God set up such a process? Well, you wouldn't think he would, would you? If, would you? Like, would you with your children set up a process where you punish them for something even that they did 10 years ago, even after they've dealt with it, would you set up a process where you've set up pro uh, this punishment process? Would you actually want the child, if this was your child, would you want them to go through this process without knowing? Not anymore. No. But, but my understanding of when I used to study, yeah. and I, I'm sitting on the fence, yeah, I've wanted guys to put their hands up, it doesn't matter which way it goes for me, yeah. so I've gone beyond that. Yeah. My understanding of how I was taught on it was that the soul knows what it's in for when it comes back down onto the earth. The recall comes in, the illusion goes over, and it's fight for your life to get back up to the higher planes. And the ones who master that through the illusion get to go further on their path. The ones who don't get another opportunity again. So in other words, you can't get up to this higher path yeah. till you master the illusion of the lower yeah, path. Yeah, that's how I was taught on yeah. reincarnation. Now these are extensions to the original reincarnation beliefs. So what happened years and years and years ago, many millennia ago, many thousands of years ago, was that these beliefs were just very, very basic. The way they began actually was that um, a child would be born and it would have seemed to have very similar characteristics to a person who recently passed. And so that, what they would say then is that the breath of life, or the soul, it later became known as, entered the new child as it was born. So this, they started believing that this must be the reincarnation now is the term. But back then it was just like the reliving or the rebirth of a person who was existing beforehand that they knew. So the that's not get still chosen like that. Yeah, it was presented like that very basically in the beginning. And then what's happened is there's certain, intellect, there's certain conundrums, if you like, that are not solved by that belief. 
Uh, one of them is, would a God of love even allow that to occur? What, what's going on? You know, why? But the, as a result of that, the belief has taken many, many forms. So, so you've got that form that you've just mentioned, you know, with, with this whole process of going to a higher place by actually mastering the lower place. But then you've got, <coughs> you've got other beliefs too, where, where it's like, this is just a continuous cycle. There's that belief too. And you can actually get into a, to a state of nirvana, if you like, on earth. That's also a belief. And so there's lots of different beliefs now associated to this reincarnation process. The key is to look at it with love every time. So let's look at your that, that one that you mentioned, which was the belief that if you master it at the soul level, you awaken at the soul level somehow, the illusion will disappear and you'll now remember what you've experienced in the past and then you'll work through it, uh, which is obviously a different process again, and then once you've mastered that, you go to the higher place. Now there's a couple of uh, things to, be, to do about that, isn't it? Firstly, we're basically saying that to get to a higher place we've got to keep returning. So it's a process of keeping returning. We also have to at some time have an awakening at the soul level. How do you have an awakening at the soul level if you've just been abused all your life and you know had some major, major damage put upon you in life after life after life after life that you haven't managed to actually have the awakening? What what's going on there? Is that is that a loving thing to to set up, do you feel? Would you set up that for your own children? That's a question. Really. So can you see with every form of reincarnation belief, if we look at it from the point of view of love, there is always some holes in it. But how does the law of attraction fit into that? Which is interesting what you just said. If there has been, there's so many abuse on the planet Earth right now, on okay. so many different levels, yep. you couldn't build a library of size a single planet. That's right. So coming back to that, yep. how does that fit into your belief on reincarnation not existing? Uh, my belief isn't that reincarnation doesn't exist. There is a reincarnation, but but I'll explain it later. Yeah. But in terms of how it fits in, um, everything that's happening on Earth is the result of man's choices to walk away from God. So there's been no interference. It's our choice. Yeah. When you say no interference, there is a lot of interference from spirits. And that's something that I want to discuss in this process because um, even these beliefs of reincarnation are very much interfered with by spirits. But there's also interstellar, interstellar belief of reincarnation from other planets. Like Certainly. And it's extraterrestrial influences, which there's so much written on that for thousands of years. Yes, but again, you need to understand what extraterrestrial influences are, which are all part of this spirit world versus material world discussion. Yeah, and they're all, all of those questions are in, they all have very similar answers actually, that are very simple. And that's the other thing that, to bear in mind, is that God makes simple things, like, you know, like on earth here, man, woman, get together, have a child. Right? So how did you come into existence at the soul level? Obviously, God got together and had you as a child. God is constantly trying to illustrate to you the truth through your own life, and that's one of the ways. So, so the key thing to here to bear in mind is that too, that this, the, the answers are actually going to be quite simple in the end. And the truth is always quite simple in the end. But usually a child can understand truth. The problem with most of religious beliefs on earth is they've been created by the intellect trying to understand emotions that they're not connecting to. And so, do you understand what I mean by that? Like, if you're in an emotional state, you don't understand it, you're not connecting to it, you're going to come up with all sorts of intellectual arguments and beliefs inside of yourself that then are spawned into religious beliefs and into religious movements even. And then there's religious movements breaking off of religious movements and this is how we arrive at the condition that we arrive on the earth today where, you, where nobody knows how to determine truth. And this is why I say to you, get back to the real simple thing is it loving. Now, we can apply the same rule to any belief, including beliefs on Christianity. Is it loving to believe that one person, right, died for all of your errors? 
Is it loving to the one person? Obviously not, is it? So therefore, it can't be a truth. It's quite simple, isn't it? If it's loving, then it can be truthful. If it's not loving, quite blatantly not loving, to one person or to many, then it must be an error. So let's apply this back to the reincarnation beliefs. Yeah. So, can you see the karmic process as described by the reincarnation belief? And I'm not saying there's no such thing as karma, because there is. But can you see the process of trying to clear it on many lifetimes without even knowing what it is? must be very difficult, and that's why often it feels impossible. <laughs> and that's why it never generally occurs. Can you also see that there is a justification of certain treatment of different types of things in this? Can you see that? For instance, this type of person might be a, if we were talking about the Hindu system, what would we call them? A person who's gone down and down and down and down and untouchable. And untouchable, yeah. Can you see how the belief actually encourages the treatment of certain people in a negative way? It's basically justifying me using that person now to clean my latrine. Which is what actually occurs in India even now. They actually lower men who are of the untouchable caste into the sewerage. And they walk around in the sewerage, in their bike, like no protective clothing or anything, cleaning it. Right? Getting rid of things in it. That's what happens. And the belief justifies it. Can you see that? If he done bad things, or she done bad things in her previous life, she deserves this treatment. Can you see? Gandhi had a lot to say about the belief, right? And uh, when he was when he was alive. Um, now let's go even further. Let's say the person becomes an animal now. Can you see how it can even justify eating meat and justify treatment of poor treatment of animals? Can you see how that can occur? Just through that belief. Now, of course, the argument would be, oh, but well, if I was enlightened, I wouldn't treat the untouchable in that way. But the truth is that whenever love is in a practice, the, the results will be loving. When it, like, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Right? What's the fruitage of these beliefs? We've got societies on earth that have believed these beliefs for thousands of years. Let's look at those societies and truly examine them in a clear, loving way. So not with judgment, but look at what the result is in that society. What's the result? Is it loving society? No. Or does it have these caste systems that have resulted from these beliefs? Can you see what's going on with many of these beliefs? By the way, again, I could apply the same thing to Christianity. Could I not? Like how much of women being put down in Christianity? So is that a loving belief? Okay. And how much were women mentioned even in the Bible? So don't you think there must have been a lot more women <laughs> than actually were mentioned? Of course. So how much of those beliefs that, you know, women can be sexually alluring and you've got to keep them separate and all those kind of things that were projected at women during those times, the same thing applies, of course. Unloving beliefs create unloving results. So, what, what are some of the other beliefs? Reincarnation. That the human soul reincarnates after a life of you that cannot be remembered in the spirit world. Yeah. The next one? Let's have the next one. That the human soul eventually becomes pure through a series of hundreds of reincarnations. Yeah. yeah. Who's read Conversations with God? Yeah. Quite a lot of them. And in one of the books, he's, I think he said to Neil Donald Walsh that he'd had 670 yeah. something. Incarnation that Neil Donald Walsh couldn't remember. Um, <laughs> we can't get it. He, he said that. So, um, does that feel like a loving process to you? 
Now, look at what happened in Neil Donald Walsh's life, personal life. He went through this really cataclysmic time in his life, didn't he, before he began communicating with the Spirit claiming to be God. And, and this got, got a lot of beautiful information through as a result, but only because he was now focusing on his emotions, which is interesting in itself. And he began living in his passion, which caused this to process to continue. So, a lot of these teachings, the New Age type teachings, are teaching this constant process of reincarnation over and over and over again. Now, let me put, ask you another question about childhood. If today your child was three years old, and it was so high, right? And then in three years' time, your child was now six years old, but it's still so high. And then in 25 years' time, your child is what now? 20, 31, whatever. And now it's still this high. Would you be starting to be worried? <laughs> Why would you be worried? Because they're not growing. What's a basic thing that we see in the world around us with regard to growth? Just constant change, isn't it? Like you see, and you can see that everything grows. Now, if something results in you not growing, is that a loving thing then? Does it make any sense from even a natural perspective? It doesn't, does it? Obviously, from a God's perspective, He created or she created everything growing, everything changing constantly. And when you grow spiritually, you are going to change. Now, people who come back have similar life, life after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Are they growing? Are they even being given an opportunity to grow? How do you grow? Yeah. By learning, isn't it? By, by learning from your mistakes. mistakes, your past experience. If you can't remember your past experience, how are you going to learn from it? You can't, can you? Now, some will argue, well, it's only in the spirit world that I learn from it, but, but if this is the area where you're clearing the karma, this is the area where you need to be learning from it, not there. You need to be learning from it here. Right? So, would you set up such a system? Just from a point of view of love yourself, I mean. Now, I'm not asking you to be God. I'm just asking you to ask, would you, as a person, set up this for your children? I'm sure the majority of us would. What else in that list that I've put there? I'll keep reading. Yeah, you can keep reading. <laughs> that the human soul cannot progress in the spirit world. Re uh, reincarnation is the only form of progression. All right. Remember, I said, and also almost all spiritual, true, uh, er, all spiritual uh, discussions about the spirit world say that there are spheres in the spirit world. Now. Up until recently, most people believe there are only seven, right? And so you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? Now there's a lot more than that, but let's let's go with what the beliefs are. So here I am on Earth. I live my life on Earth. I pass into supposedly the first sphere. If it was my first incarnation, I have my life review. I go back to Earth. I can't remember my life review. But now I'm meant to progress somehow on this life to get to the point where I can grow in love to this point, yeah? And then eventually to this point. And then to this point and so forth until I reach, you might call it, you know, the pinnacle, if you like, where you don't need to reincarnate anymore. And in fact, in that place, a lot of these, spirit, these spiritual teachers say you have become God, or you become a part of God again, is the new age type feeling, and so forth. Now, firstly, does it make sense to prevent a person from progressing unless they regress? Does that sound like, like this? You know, when you do in your own life, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step. Two steps forward, one step back. When you start doing that, like, it does feel like you're dancing, isn't it? Does it feel like you're actually progressing? Would you walk that way? 
<laughs> so, you know, if you wanted to walk from from uh, Marucci across to uh, to Malulaba, you imagine one, two, one, one, two. How far would that be? Does that seem like the most logical thing to do to you? It doesn't, does it? Why would God create what seems to be to us an illogical thing? Exactly. It's a justification, actually, for punishment and pain. See, what, what a lot of these beliefs began in was the feeling that they were being punished all the time came through a lot, right? Feeling emotionally. And they're trying to explain the reason for this punishment. Now, there were some people who didn't even believe in God, so they were trying to explain the reason for why they felt like they were getting punished. And so they came up with some of these beliefs as a result, which do explain to a degree, if you accept them, why it seems like you're getting punished in your life. Don't they? That's probably why many... How many of you in the past have actually believed in reincarnation? Like, full on. Yeah. So the majority, right? So you must have believed in it for a reason. We'll talk about some of those reasons in the next section. Right? But... Can you see how there is a lot of flaws with the arguments from a point of view of love? Now, imagine if you did that, if you made a system where they couldn't progress into a new universe, let's call these new universes that are more loving, you couldn't progress into these new universes without going to the worst possible universe first and living that again. That Doesn't that feel quite unfair? Like. You've done all the work here to get from there to there, and then you've got to go back here to get from there to there. How would you feel about that? How do you feel inside of yourself about it? Doesn't it feel unfair? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any logical sense. But does it? how does it feel? It feels unfair <coughs> if you let yourself feel about it. Would God create things that are unfair? If, if there was a loving God, would God create things unfair? Maybe I should ask that question. I just got to give up my fire again. Sorry? I said the one that you're talking about, would it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Fire away. No, in my system we're never ignorant. I've never said we're ignorant. No, but um, they could damage by a parent or whatever yeah. from the child. Yeah. But then we, then we reach a stage where we might come in contact with you, like I am yesterday, <laughs> and, and uh, um, realise that there is a way out, you know, of, of personal injury or whatever it is. Yes, and, yeah. And, but a loving God, why would a loving God set it up that way that uh, we're all in, you know, mystery and And the question is more, why would man set it up that way? Well, I mean, um, man set up the other things too. But well, let, let me, let, this is, by the way, this is born from a feeling inside of you, this question. It's born from a feeling inside of you that God, like, is not as a nasty and punishing God. Um, I, I come from the same um, background as other people. Yeah. Yeah. I will accept this by um, so the, against authority. Yeah, so it's important to firstly to understand where the basis of these questions come from inside yeah, of yourself. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you follow yeah, me? I understand. So I'm not, I will answer your question, but it's important firstly that you understand yeah, where the basis of the question is coming from. It's coming from this feel, feeling inside of you that God's a punishing God. I'm angry with God. Yeah, I accept that. Yeah. How many of you feel angry with God if you're honest with yourselves? I feel I've been dealt bad, you know, the joker has come in, you know, like what happened to the ace of spades? There's a lot more of you who feel that God's a punishing God, by the way, than who feel about being him. Not being truthful with yourself, people. It's not good. <laughs> Truthfulness is essential. Let's look at this question. What I'm saying is that God gave you a gift, which is... Mm -hmm. 
gave you the ability, and every other person before you, the ability to exercise it in an unlimited way. You can even exercise it and break the laws if you choose. Now, what happened after that gift was given is all of us, each individual here, has a choice. Are you going to exercise your free will in harmony with love? Or are you going to exercise your free will how you feel like doing it? Thank you very much and blow the consequences. Right. That's your choice. That is placed before you. That choice was placed before the first human couple and it will be placed before every single person that ever exists. That same choice. Now when you place, give that gift, how people use the gift, what's a gift? Isn't it where you're saying, here's what I've given you, it's now yours. Yeah, don't you do that? Yeah. Do you then dictate how they use it? No. Some of you do. <laughs> but it's not a gift. It's not a gift if you're doing it, but of course some of you do, right? So already we're out of harmony with love, right? But anyway. If we really love the person and we're giving this gift, what's happening then? Really what's happening then is that we've given this gift and they are able to use that gift as if it's their own. It is their own, is it not? Yes. So you can give your son a gift. Uh, let's say it's a new car. And he you know, goes down to his mates. What is, what is he tempted to do? You know, <laughs> you know slap it in gear and be, be spinning out. That's his choice of how to use your gift, isn't it? Now, if you get angry about that, then you, you weren't giving him a gift. You were giving him something else. Some expectations, right? But anyway, God doesn't give like that. When God gives you a gift, you are given the gift. It's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Totally up to you. God is not going to dictate to you how this gift is used. This gift of free will. Now, if I decide to use this gift of free will out of harmony with love, and God has set up a lot of other laws to maintain the harmony of the universe, what's going to happen? If I decide that, let's say, all of God's laws, so here's God's universe, and all of the universe laws are governed by love. And I'm sitting in the middle of this universe, and I decide I'm going to use this gift God's now given me in total disharmony with love. What's automatically going to happen to me? I'm automatically going to be out of harmony. Am I not? Yes. The instant that decision is made. And as soon as I'm out of harmony, what happens? Straight away I'm going to be feeling this lovely corrective thing called pain. I'm going to start feeling pain. And this is where all pain comes from. All pain comes from the choice inside of any individual to actually live out of harmony with love. Okay, so then isn't that not a gift now? Isn't that like the guy, like the, you give your son a car and he goes out and burns the wheels and whatever and you say, no way, that's, you've got to pray for that now. You've got to mow my lawns and do this and punish him for burning the wheels out. But you gave him the gift and he's using it how he wants to use it. But now you... you no, the way God set up the universe is that we're actually, we're actually punishing ourselves right. when we're out of harmony with love. Okay. God so doesn't punish us. Yeah, he would have to... Like, if I was treating my son the same way, yeah. he would have to pay for his own tithes. He would have to pay his own fine when he gets fined by the police. He would have to... Yeah. And that's still loving, isn't it? Yeah. He's still got his free will. He can break the laws and do whatever he wants. But, but he has... In this case, the, 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 so that son is saying, oh, well... Go ahead and do that. Do the thing with the tyres and burn them out in one day and then pay 600 bucks because I'm not doing that. And that's how God's treating us. God is not going to take responsibility for your choice to do an unloving thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's really quite simple, isn't it, in a way? So God makes that choice to give you the gift 
but God is also giving you in that gift is there's a responsibility. And the responsibility is you are now totally under control <coughs> of your own life at the soul level. That's your responsibility. AJ, can I just ask, yep. when you talk about pain there, yep. if something happens and you experience grief, that to me is pain. Yep. But is that, if you're experiencing grief over, well, over someone you've lost or yep. whatever, is that being out of harmony with love? Yes. In what way? Well, well, if you're in harmony with love, you'd be blissful all the time, wouldn't you? Even if you've lost someone you love? There's no such thing as loss. So the grief comes from a false belief. You're only, you're only grieving because either you're missing them, you can't communicate with them anymore, and all of these things are all coming from false beliefs. The truth is you can communicate with them, they are still alive, and all you can still have a relationship with them, you can even see them, and in later in your own development here on earth, you will be seeing some of your dead friends that have passed, right? You will, right? You know, in the future, if you stay here on earth, you will actually see these people in what seems to be the flesh, even. These are things that are all possible, but we just don't believe it. Right. And it, the grief comes from the error belief, not from the truth. Does that make sense? Yep. AJ, is yep. it possible that we see them, if we, only if we progress in with our emotional journeys, or is that like a new time on it where everyone, regardless of their state, will be able to see it? Yeah, second, second answer, which is everyone will be able to see it. The reason it why... Now. Sorry? <laughs> Not getting involved in those. Because, because it depends on the soul condition collectively of mankind. See, at the moment, if people started materialising right in front of you, what would most people feel? Yeah. Absolutely freaked out. They not. Now, so that means, the, uh, for, before a spirit can really materialise in front of you, you need to have dealt with quite a lot of your fears and your false beliefs and all of these things, right? So the earth will get to a point, and it won't be long away, where, where many people on earth are getting to the point where they've dealt with these beliefs, where there won't be this instant bad negative reactions to these materialisations. The truth is that these materialisations happen now, but they're done in such a, done in such a uh, non-invasive way that everyone thinks they're just people on earth, right? So, many of you will pass in the spirit world and a spirit will come to you and say, oh, you remember this guy that you met then? Yeah, that was actually me. And that was me, I was given the task of materialising a body to help you through a different, through, through a process that you went through. And many of you will actually have had that experience in your life and not been aware of it because you would have thought that well, you're just interacting with a person. Isn't that reincarnation? No, no. Materialization and reincarnation are totally different. Reincarnation is actually re being reborn into a child form, growing. What I'm talking about with materialization is materialization is a spirit creating an instant form that they can utilize for a certain job, for a certain period of time and then returning back to the spirit world. And that happens all the time. Through all the spheres? And no, it's only the spirits in higher spheres that are capable of doing it. Yeah. The lower spheres, they need groups of spirits getting together to create a form. So you know what a ghost is? Well, often it's like a thousand spirits creating a form to scare people. Because one of them can't do it by themselves very easily. Because, you know, the reports of people they are angels, having yeah. those experiences, but they're, they're bigger than angels. Yeah, well, let's define an angel. An angel is any person who's progressed above the seventh sphere in the spirit world, a person who's at one with God, and there's billions of them. And yes, they are able to materialise forms and utilise them in these ways. At the back? Yep. So I didn't hear the question. Just what I'm doing. Could you tell me about life contracts and if they exist? Um, contracts that will make you... Yeah, I know the question. Um, the, I would like to say on the subject of reincarnation, I've got a bit off it already. Uh, the short answer is no, they don't exist. Um, 
It's a byproduct of reincarnation. However, you have passions that you will realize. Do you understand the difference? Like one, one a life contract is like a, a statement that somebody else or I myself in a previous life have actually determined what I'm going to do in this life. Now God doesn't do that with you. However, what God does is wants you to act, realize what your passions are and follow them. And spirits in the spirit world can see your passions and see where they're going to lead you and they often tell you that that's your life contract because that's their belief. We'll talk about a lot of these interactions with spirits through this process. Okay, I have had two experiences that I'm aware of of what you're talking about. Yeah. I was in Greece after a seminar and I was walking down the street and I was struggling with my bag. I was getting angrier and angrier because all the Greek men were looking at me as if, you know, I'm not going to help you. And my friend that was walking ahead of me, she, she could see that I was in a process, so she just let me go through it. And all of a sudden, I was burst into tears and I realised that that was um, my um, stuff with my father from childhood. Yep. He grew up in Albania where the men sat around drinking coffee. Yep. And all of a sudden, as soon as I got back, this man appeared before me, out of nowhere, took my bag, took it all the way down the street to my hotel, yep. as if he knew where I was staying. Yep. And I didn't know where I was staying. Okay. <laughs> yep. These and are the kinds of things that happen, by the way. Yes, I did. It, it was an angel. Yep. And he was also uh, Lebanese, and I had been married to a yeah. <laughs> It was just so many connections. Yeah. And the moment I turned to thank him after he came me to the door, he was, he was gone. gone. Yeah. And I've had that happen twice. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things happen a lot, right? And uh, many people can relate the experience because they were conscious of them, but many can't because they weren't conscious of what was going on at the time. These happen all the time. But anyway, back to the discussion, which happens to be reincarnation. <laughs> Can we remember? <laughs> I'll try and remember. <laughs> All right. So, can you see that a lot of times uh, the uh, the question being asked was what what's the difference between what I'm teaching and the reincarnation belief? Well, obviously, what I'm teaching is that every time you do something out of harmony with love, there will be pain associated with that to correct you. It's an automatic correcting thing to tell you that you're out of harmony with love. Right? Now, whether you're conscious of that pain or not often depends on how sensitive you are to your own pain. But uh, you will feel pain every time you do something out of harmony with love. Now, God gave you this gift of free will to exercise how you desire. And you can exercise it out of harmony with love. You're allowed to. God doesn't even stop you. And God says, oh, isn't it lovely? She's exercising that out of harmony with love. I've made such a perfect system. Because sooner or later she'll feel the pain and she'll realise that she was out of harmony with love. Mind you, I could talk to God and find out whether I'm out of harmony with love before I went and did it anyway. But a lot of times we don't do that either, do we? We go ahead and do something and then we realise the mistake. Alright, what's next in the list here? That the human soul reincarnates into female or male forms depending on karmic debt. Yeah. Who's heard that? Like, previous life I was a man and I did this and I did that and I did this. Previous life before that I was a female. Yep. I did that and I did this. And, you know, in the previous life. Yep. Creates a lot of uh, gender confusion issues, wouldn't you think? Yep. Can you see? Um, a lot of times, a lot of beliefs actually prevent you from connecting to either your masculinity or your femininity. And uh, the reincarnation beliefs is one of those beliefs that prevent you from connecting fully to what your half of the soul really is, whether it's masculine or feminine. And, uh, and that's part of the problem with some of these beliefs. Can you see that? You see how we create that confusion? Imagine if you're having feelings and memories of a previous life where you were a woman and you're a man right now making love to a woman. That would certainly uh, cause some problems, don't you think? Wouldn't you know what you really like? What 
Peter said was, uh, you know what she really likes. <laughs> but can you see how that creates a lot of gender specific issues? It's actually spirit attachments, and we'll talk more about what it actually is that that's going on. Um, but it's not that you had a previous life as a different sex. Alright? Alright, what else? That the human soul reincarnates into a lesser form if the karma has been regressing. Yeah, we've talked about that, right? <laughs> the lesser one, what's next? That the human soul reincarnates into a more painful experience if Sorry, that the human life ultimately leads to or contains pain and suffering for purification purposes. Yeah, now this is something I would like to talk about a bit. Let's say you're God. For a moment. And you create this system where pain is the only way people can progress. Does that make a lot of sense to you? Because that's what a lot of these beliefs are saying. Can you see that that's what these beliefs are saying? If you, pain is the only way, pain and suffering is the only way you can actually progress. So it's great that you've got pain and suffering. Now, I do believe that it's good that you have pain and suffering in the sense that if you're doing something disharmonious with love, you need to know about it, and the pain is the thing that tells you. Right? However, I don't agree that God created a system where you can only progress in pain. And in fact, many of you, after you've released your pain, will continue progressing throughout eternity without pain. Now won't that be a joy? Yes. yes. And that's what God wanted right from the start, was to, to desire to progress without pain. But to do that, you would have to exercise your free will, harmonious with love, and have a desire for God to tell you when you're about to do something out of love and with love. And when you walk away from God, you walk away from that connection. So if you connect to God, you can now connect to God in the way of God informing you what was loving and what isn't. And after you've gotten through the seventh sphere of your own progression, into the first celestial sphere, the eighth sphere, which is the point of abundance with God, from then on you will never progress with any, you, you will never have painful experiences in your progression. Sounds pretty sweet. It's only up till then that we have these painful experiences because we have, as a race, walked away from God. And even on an individual basis, day by day, many of us still choose, don't we, to walk away from God in many of our choices. And so each of us, like I said earlier, will be faced with the choice, when am I going to start doing things God's way? Or am I going to keep doing things using my free will how I want? Hey, yep. is a child able to acknowledge God from a young age? Yeah. Actually, the way God created her system was that while the child is in the mother's womb, it can receive divine love. If the mother is receiving divine love. If the, if the, if the mother or the father are making choices that aren't within that, are they not influencing the child? In they, are the certain, from God? they are certainly influencing the child, but that is their free will. Just like I have the free will to influence you in a negative way. It makes no difference whether it's a child or an adult. We all have the choice to influence others in a negative or a positive way with regard to love. And that doesn't change from the moment in the incarnation forever in our existence. You have the choice. Uh, right from that time. Well, where does that change in that case? They last to be influenced in negative ways like parents. Very true. And that's why, you know, this system is very unloving and but it's man's creation. So God didn't create that system. What God, God created was the first human couple were in a perfect condition. Therefore, any children they would have had would have been in a perfect condition. If they had fo if they had both all focused on their connection with God, there would have been no emotional damage. Therefore, every subsequent generation would be in an emotionally pristine condition, being able to do whatever they want. Right? But man, 
through the use of its exercise of free will, decided that they wanted to walk away from God and be God themselves. In fact, the first human couple decided they wanted to be gods. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Isn't that sound familiar to what the, many of the New Age teachings are? Yeah. You are gods, right? Yeah. And the first human couple wanted to be gods. And they decided to do that, they could walk away from God, and this is the problem that it gets us into in the end. Well, actually, initially, when you're first born, it's your parents who are suffering this, their own sins of their projection at you. For example, when you're first born, what normally happens? The child starts screaming, right? Does it not? Yes. Now, if a parent was really, really focused on feeling their pain, wouldn't they feel the pain of their child screaming? And then wouldn't they make the step of saying, all right, my child is screaming because of things I've done. I'm the one that's getting the hurt from this child screaming. I'm the, getting the reflection. So many times during your formative years, you were the perfect reflector back to your parent. The perfect reflector of their error. And if those parents were humble, they would have corrected that. And instantly, the correction would have been noticed in your treatment of them. And so God actually created a perfect system to, to correct the parent even by the incarnation process of these new children. So the whole system is actually very perfect if you look at it from this perspective. Now, many of you are looking at it from the perspective of the other perspective, which is, I got all this damage from my parents. The truth is that every single bit of damage you got from your parents will be cleared from you by God if you choose to allow God with your free will to do that. But any damage you created, you will have to actually deal with through a different way. So, so the truth is that everybody does have complete responsibility for their own emotion. Right? And that includes all of this damage from your childhood. Your parents have responsibility for that. You don't have responsibility for that. All you need to do is allow yourself to feel and God will remove it from you. Children are so full of fear that they don't cry at all. Like, they really are. Mm -hmm. um, Terrified. And people say that they're such a good baby. Uh, yeah. And parents are so congratulated because they have good children have the same yeah. In fact, they're probably terrified. Yeah. Wake up. Um, but we're back off the subject, so for our yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's get back on. Let's look at. So I want to look at the next section because it's really important. The majority of you have believed in reincarnation, right, at some point. Let's look at the reasons why you did and explain them from a point of view of what's actually happening. So, can you see that in the next section? Would you like to read the first one out? Children speaking wisdom from old, remembering past life experience or initiating, imitating, imitating dead relatives. So, how many of you have had that experience with your own children? Some of you? How many of you have been in that position yourself? Where, you know, you've felt like all of a sudden this wonderful wisdom just comes out of your mouth and you go, whoa, where did that come from? And you go to a psychic and she says, oh, it come from your soul. In a previous life you learned that truth. What's actually happening? Here's the spirit world. Here's you. You have a guide. Many of you have guides on the, net, on the divine love path, so you have guides up in the spirit world in one of the spheres, guiding you. <coughs> Whenever they can connect to you, they will give you whatever they can give you, if you're open to it. When are you most open? When you're a child. This is why children in particular have lots of wisdom coming through them. Because their guide is actually helping that entire process. Right? Now sometimes it's not wisdom coming through them, it's actually harmful habits or experiences. And that's because sometimes, and in many cases, there is a darker spirit in the first sphere, usually a relative of some kind, or a person who is frightening the child, you're also trying to influence the child. What do they get out of doing that? And if they're making them afraid, a lot of times joy. They feel joy. 
they feel the feeling of, isn't it great? In reality, they're very powerless, and the only people that they have power over is a child who's easily influenced. And of course, none of this would happen if the parents were in a good condition emotionally, say mum and dad were in a good condition emotionally, they would protect the child, they're, they're, the protection surrounding them would protect the child, and the child wouldn't have those influences. But the problem is, of course, that most parents are not in good condition emotionally, and so what do they do? There's no protection of the child, and the only person who can protect the child is God and this guide, or the guardians that are with the child, and they do the best they can, given the circumstances, but there are often these negative influences allowed by the environment. So, when a child receives actual information like the wisdom, they are usually getting it from their guide. All children are mediumistic. All children are mediumistic. So therefore, all children have this capability of seeing spirits. Many of them have imaginary friends, you call them. They don't call them imaginary, they call them friends, right? Now, how many of you even have had this all your life, where you've connected with spirits or known about connections with spirits? It's quite a lot of you, right? Yeah. How many of you turned it off, or you can't even remember when you ever had it? Okay. Most of the time, the damage by the environment is so great that even in a few years, by the time we even have a mind where we can remember these events, we've already got the emotion that prevents them. They're all heavily influenced by spirits of different types. And you can tell the type of spirit by what the person is saying. So many are Catholic type spirits nowadays influencing different children that are Catholic. And because there's that environment in the parents that allow that, of course that, are, that goes on. In India it happens all the time. You've got young children even not, not eating for years because they're so overcloaked by a spirit that they don't need to eat anymore. Right? Things like that. Constant. This is constantly happening. Right? And we go, wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> In reality, it's just this natural laws totally at work all the time. Ange? That's the spirit, yeah. Um, how many of you have been to Pentecostal religion? How many of you have been to... How many actually have done speaking in tongues? Some of you? Yeah, that's the spirit overcloaking you. From what, from what sphere? And most of the time it's from the first or second sphere um, because spirits in a higher location generally wouldn't communicate with you in that manner. But if you're saying things that are legible, in other words, in a different language, well, it could be a spirit from a higher sphere. In the first century, you've heard of Pentecost? Yeah. You've heard of that? 50 days after my death, there was Pentecost. In Pentecost, there was 120, around about, people in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, they, they'd been crying for 50 days. So, if you, you can imagine dealing with causal emotion for 50 days crying, then you're in a pretty good emotional state, right? And then what happened? was that they connected with God all that, all that time and received a lot of divine love. And so then spirits could actually speak through them in different languages. And you've heard of Peter, the apostle, so-called Apostle Peter. He spoke to 3,000 people in a language he'd never learned before. It was a spirit overcloaking him and doing that. So all of those things are possible. That when you speak to us? Um, in what way? Oh, well, maybe. Well, do you feel like you're just you guided to, to say what you're going to say sometimes here? Um, totally. If, if I'm, what I'm feeling is thing, feelings from you, and I'm responding to feelings inside of you when I'm speaking generally, and my connection with God and the com combination of my connection with God and your feelings create, and not only your feelings by the way, the feelings of spirits that are here with us too, wanting the answers to these kind of questions, and and my responses are based around all of those events occurring. And by the way, yours are too. You may not just be conscious of it, but yours are too. Um, and just a question, um, you talked about parents particularly children, and yep. 
Uh, both of these, but the fastest way, both grow in divine love. You grow in divine love, you're releasing your emo negative emotions that cause law of attraction. You're also actually in now a protective state. But the very fastest way is just to pray or long for protection of the child. And you will have it. Just like that. God answers all of those things immediately. Um, who's read Robert James Lee's book? I think it's The Life of Elysian. It was in where um, this young 18 year old man was with an older man. They went into a pub sort of scene where there was a lot of uh, prostitutes around and they were going to have a drink. And remember, he described that he had two spirits with him. This 18 year old son had two spirits with him who were protecting him because of the prayers of his mother. So it's really easy to protect the children. Sorry. Actually, you know, if parents are in a situation where they would protect a child like that, and yeah. somebody else knows about that child, and somebody else prays yes. for that child, yes. that's the same. Same effect. It, the child will be protected even more than it's currently being protected as a result of that. What about white light meditations, things like that? Is there any and anything metaphysical is not happening at the soul level. So while it will benefit you to a degree intellectually and your spirit form, it will benefit, it's not going to, call, to cure any soul issues within you. But what about with communicating with other levels there? Is that well, it, isn't it better just to go straight to the source? Yeah. What's the source? God. Just go straight to God and say, I need some help here. And I need some help. Like, it's really simple. Yeah. You know, uh, many of you have been taught to do this meditation process or get yourself into a good state, but a lot of that kind of thing is just bypassing. It's being self-reliant and bypassing God. Um, can I proceed with the discussion? Yes. Okay. What's the next point? People with physical maladies that mirror the maladies of a person who has maladies. Maladies, sorry. Yeah. Go on. Of a person who has recently passed. Okay. How many of you have noticed that uh, someone passes, and it might be even an older person who passed years ago that you knew, and then you've got a child or something, and the child starts getting sick, or even as a young adult starts getting sick, and they have very similar mannerisms to this person who's passed, who happened to get sick in the same way that this child's getting sick. You ever heard of that happening? Yeah. That happens quite a lot, right? And what we then go down to, well, are they the reincarnation of that person? But what's actually happening is the person who passed is now a spirit who has yet to really progress. And they are heavily overcloaking that individual, the person that's left on earth. And because the spirit who's passed still believes themselves to have the malady, the sickness, that malady also gets impressed upon the child. Now, I've seen this happen a lot with leukemia. It, almost all childhood sicknesses are the result of spirit attachments. And if they're not the result of spirit attachments, they're a result of inherent emotions. Almost all childhood sicknesses. And really easy. You just talk to the spirit and get them to understand what they're doing. That they and most of the time they're not malevolent. They're not trying to do it. They just love the child, or they think they love the child. Like I had one with a great grandmother who was with a child who was three years of age, and she was in the spirit world. Child three on earth had leukemia. The great grandmother died of cancer. It was the grandmother's emotions being impressed on the child because obviously the lineage also had the same emotions. Impressed upon the child that caused the child to have the same illness. As soon as the grandmother stepped back, the child was cured. Uh, just by the grandmother stepping back, once she knew what she was doing, <coughs> she stepped back and stepped away from the child and as a result, from an emotional perspective, stopped impressing all of these emotions upon the child and as a result the child was cured straight away. Same with cerebral palsy, you know, the people who are, the children who are very incapacitated. Are we talking uh, the same sort of thing there? Yeah, cerebral palsy and Down syndrome and those kind of things that result from uh, genetic imperfections. 
generally are caused by emotional genetic imperfections in the lineage that need to be released. So that's what, that's one instance where it's often not the spirit, but actually genetic, caused by emotional damage. So the key is to release the emotional damage. And then the rest of the genealogy will not have that problem. first talk to those spirits. We'll talk to those spirits now. Right at this moment, there is literally thousands of spirits waiting to help them right now. These spirits are brighter spirits who want to help these spirits who are in a darker condition. Now, many of the spirits are here with us because they believed in reincarnation was their only hope. They believed that reincarnation, in other words, returning back to Earth, was their only hope of getting out of their dark condition. So they feel a very hopelessness now when I'm starting to say that there's no such thing as reincarnation in the way they believed it. Because they feel that, does that make sense to all of you too? Like imagine for instance that you've believed all of your life that, that the only way for you to get better is to come back to earth and relive another life where you can live it in a much more positive way. You'd be hanging out to come back, wouldn't you? Yeah. That's right. Because you believe that belief system so deeply in your soul, you put off things. The belief system you're saying is now being undone. Yep. And now I'm filled with regret. Hopeless and regret. Well, the key thing for all of the spirits who are feeling these emotions is to feel your emotions. Cry and let yourself release these feelings, right? But remember that there's these bright spirits who are there waiting to tell you the truth. They're waiting to connect with you and talk to you about the divine truth, the real truth that God has created in the universe and how everything actually does work. And God's just waiting to help you, but you need to be open to this help. So if, if the bright spirits just show themselves to these spirits, which they now, are now doing, and what they will do now is they'll, they'll show them, they'll show themselves to these spirits. Now, all of those spirits who are feeling this hopeless feeling about what I've been discussing, you can talk with these people. And please go and talk with them and, and, and listen to what they say about true progression. Right, so do that. And if you do that, you will not be so feeling so hopeless about the fact that there is no reincarnation as you've believed. It. How are you feeling? You're feeling a bit lighter? I can just feel it. Yeah, no, that feeling. And um, where is the mic? Oh, okay. Sorry, I can't quite get it. If you can put it a bit closer, the mic a bit closer to you. Why do other spirits allow children to die if they've got routine or be more loving to go and advise the spirits that are causing them? And they always go and advise the spirits who are causing leukemia. Because the spirit refuses to disconnect from the child. So, so this is all about, again, the law of attraction and the laws of free will. What actually happens is, this spirit here, if this child would have a guide, right? And a guardian. This guardian is trying to tell this spirit, don't do this, stop doing this, this is harming you, this child. But this spirit is often so consumed with its own emotions and its own selfish feelings that it doesn't want to do what the spirit's advising it. Do you follow me? How many times does this happen on earth? Somebody's hurting somebody else. I've had it happen in the last few weeks. Two people were hurting somebody else. I go and tell the person, you're hurting her, you know. And what do they do? Hurt her some more. You know, this often happens on earth and it happens in the spirit world as well. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so these things are, there's constant, God, once you are in the spirit world, you see this constant, constant effort by God and all of these spirits to make it better. But you also see the constant <coughs> influence of the spirits who are selfish and full of other emotions trying to make it worse. So what truth does is expose all of this and make it better. That's what the whole point of this discussion really is about. Thank you. Does that lower spirit think he's right? Yeah, this lower spirit thinks it's totally right. He's, he's able to do that. He wants to do it. And you're not going to tell him any different. And that happens on earth. And that happens on earth all the time, doesn't it? All the time. Yeah. And that same emotion many people pass with, of course. And so they are just going to keep learning what they want to do until their pain gets so great that they stop. That's the thing. Can we pick up these lower spirits in our age? Any age. It all depends on it. Like, like I, I've had spirits with me the last few ways of different emotions that I've been processing. I feel spirits be attracted to that emotion because they have the same emotion. It's just all to do with the law of attraction. Right. Okay. So what's probably happened is there's a spirit there who was who was killed, and and that spirit is attached to you because there's a like attraction. There'd be an emotion in you that feels the same as the emotion in them, and it's actually a law of attraction to help you deal with that emotion and help the spirit deal with that emotion. And the key is to allow yourself to feel those emotions completely and connect with your causes. And the spirit who's with you, who's now listening to this needs to connect with her causes as to what happened to her right? in the same manner. And if you both do that, you will both feel lighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just make an observation? Before you were talking to the spirits, I would hardly stay awake. I, I was just flat and wanted to go home with it. And all of a sudden, I just woke up. So what do you feel happened there? Well, I think probably a spirit was sitting on my head or something. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of times what's actually happening is like that. A lot of times what's happening is there are spirits not wanting to hear certain things. And what they do if they're with you is they want you to not hear it too. Do you follow me? And so you get all sleepy and you get all lethargic. You won't feel involved in the whole discussion. And then all of a sudden when they have a realisation, all of a sudden you perk up as well, right? Because now they've had a realisation, they're no longer affecting you with your realisations. Honestly, spirit influence is constant in your life. Every single moment of your awake and sleep time, you spend usually in company. Right? Whether you know it or not. Funny, 15 minutes ago, I was going off to sleep. Um, yeah. Tara, through part of the discussion. Yeah. He was just saying that 15 minutes ago he was going to sleep. Now he's now really like alive. You know? <laughs> uh, going back to something you talked about earlier with uh, illness, and then taking it back further, where you said sometime in the future the world's population will be at a point where we're all aware of this. Does that mean once we're all aware of that and we're all exercising our free will in harmony with love? There won't be any illness. That's there right. There won't be any issue that way. There won't be any illness at all. This is a bit sounding like utopia. That's what I can feel from some of you. Like, oh, this is getting a bit way out there, utopia, right? <laughs> and, but this is the way God created the universe. It's just that we're so far removed from it, it doesn't happen. And all we need to do is bring ourselves into harmony with it, and it will begin happening, right? And can we get back to the discussion? <laughs> uh, what's the next point? General memories of previous life experiences, mostly previous passing death experiences. Okay, how many of you have had that? Where you've had the feeling that you died as this person or that person, this kind of experience? Some of you, right? What's actually happening is this. Here's you. Here's a spirit in the spirit world. It doesn't have to be the same gender. Right? There's a law of attraction emotion between the two of you. Right? If it was an opposite gender, it might be... A, when I say law of attraction emotion, it doesn't mean it's the same emotion. It means it's a synthetic emotion. 
Do you understand the difference between us? Right, okay, I'll explain. A sympathetic emotion is, let's say, I feel like I'll do anything for a woman no matter what. What kind of a woman am I going to attract? A woman who's going to boss me around and do anything she wants. Does that make sense? That's the law of attraction. You follow me? That's what I would call a sympathetic attraction. Right? Now, all attractions are usually based on sympathetic attractions. So we have a spirit in the spirit world. So here's the spirit world, here's the earth, you're here. Now, you already have similar emotions. Right? And then what happens is something triggers in your life and all of a sudden you get a flood of events or an event, usually it's one event, coming to you along with some emotions and some pictures even flowing into you. Right? And what it is, is this spirit is telling you her or his experience, trying to connect with you like we are similar, we have similar emotions. I had this experience when I was on earth too, and you know that's what the spirit's trying to do in the majority of cases. Right? But what do we do? Because we believe in reincarnation, we interpret it as past life, which actually complicates the problem, both for yourself and the spirit. The spirit now feels unheard. Oh, you know, there's another person I tried to connect to, and. You know, they're not hearing me, they think it's them, you know. So there's, there's this confusion often in the spirit. But also for ourselves, we are then attributing a lot of our emotions to this past life and avoiding the emotional experience that's being triggered, which is actually quite damaging to us. Does that make sense, what's going on there? Yeah? Okay. Is there questions related to that? Yep, yep, there's lots of spirits involved in all of these interactions. Uh, because of our common sets of emotions with our friends as well, often spirits also have their friends, right? And they gather around us and there's all these interrelating experiences that start getting related as well. So it gets quite complicated, in fact very complicated, where even thousands or hundreds of thousands of people can have spirits influencing them in large numbers. That's why sometimes you get this group thing just shift from one to another instantly for no seeming reason. And a lot of times it's spirit influence as well. Well, another time I was doing a healing on somebody and I got a vision of blood, like thick blood, like yep. mercury moving across the floor, and blood splattered along the walls. Yep. And I got a, a message, I guess, that the person I was working on was responsible for that blood shift. But what we were doing was clearing the karma. What was actually happening was there was a, during the process of many healing processes, spirits surround you. And because you're in a more open, in a more open way, mediumistic during those processes, and there must have been a spirit with her at some time or with you, and what they've done is just channel to you their own experience. The way to deal with it is to talk to that spirit that they can actually progress that they can actually work through their stuff in the spirit world. They don't have to come back to earth. They don't have to tell people on earth even what they did. They can actually deal with it in the spirit world. Uh, but many spirits don't believe that because of the law, because of reincarnation. They believe the only way they can deal with it is by coming back to earth. Uh, so the key again is to talk to the spirits about what the truth is and help them come to terms with what's going on. So you weren't actually clearing away the karma of the person's past life. What you were doing is actually helping the spirit deal with some of its guilt about what had happened. And the attraction, the law of attraction between the spirit and the lady you were working with, was it a lady? Was that she had guilt that she needed to work through. Does that make sense? And you could connect with perhaps some of that guilt when you were working with her. Yep. Right. Next point. Psychics or mediums sensing previous life personalities and experiences, talking of old souls. Okay. So here's a medium. 
here's you. You go along to this meeting. Right? Now, the medium is often what you would also classify as psychic. In fact, many times they classify themselves as that, right? What that means is they are sensitive to emotion. They call themselves sensitives, right? What they're doing is they're sensitive to emotion. They think they're sensitive to your emotion many times. But they're not actually just sensitive to your emotion. They are sensitive to emotion of all these spirits that are around you and around them. Huh? There's all these spirits around them all the time. Particularly because they are mediums and spirits can talk to them, right? So, what's happening is, they, you go along to this medium to find out about how you're doing, and they say, oh, there's this person here, there's this and there, that, and sometimes you might recognise them as a relative, a past relative or something, but oftentimes you don't even recognise them at all. And the reason why is because this, this psychic has all these spirits around them, you have all these spirits around them, and this person is sensitive to all of that emotion. And they can't differentiate which bit was your emotion, which bit was this one's emotion, which bit was this one's emotion, which bit was this guide's emotion way up here in the spirit world. They can't tell the difference between them all. And because they're sensitive to the emotion, you're also sensitive to the thoughts and memories of each person. So they get fragmented memories from all sorts of people coming into them thinking they're part of your experience. And because they believe in reincarnation, they then interpret all of that as your past life experiences. Right. Does that make sense what's happening there? Yes. Yeah. Because remember I said there's spirits around you all the time. All the time. And you are able to feel their emotions. So why can't this person who's sensitive feel them? Right. If I can feel your emotions here, I can feel your emotions in the spirit world, can't I? We're the same soul, are we not? Just a different body. So what's happening when the psychics are trying to tell the future? When they're trying to tell your future, many times. There's, a, let's say there's some relatives around you, then there's your guide around you, and there's all these other people around you who are interested in you, who have passed. Right? And the psychic's trying to get information from them all to tell you. Now, some of that information is going to be in, from spirits in low spheres, some of it's going to be from spirits in a higher sphere. Can you see what's going on? There'll be all this mixture of information going on. Some of it's going to be accurate, because the ones in the higher sphere are more accurate. Some is going to be not very accurate because the ones in the lower spheres are obviously much less accurate. So you've got all this confusion happening. And when, when I've seen uh, some mediums myself, you can often tell if you're feeling the emotion. You can tell when they've switched connection. You can tell when they've switched it to another spirit. You know, and you can tell the fragmentation that's occurring at any one time. All of that is not proof that there's reincarnation, is it? All of that is just communication between friends. <laughs> if you can look at it that way, that's really all it is. Communication between people with like attractions. Right. Gary? Uh, like, they're not actually telling you your future, they're, they're um, suggesting something that they'd like you to do. Oftentimes they are suggesting things that they want you to do. But not in the future, they can't tell you. Well, no, they can to a degree because there's no time in the spirit world. So they can actually, there are snapshots that you can take based on the person's emotional condition right now and predict what they will do. You can do that quite easily. You also can you see pictures, and you, by the way, have this ability too, to see pictures of your own future. How many of you have had pictures of your own future come to you? Half, almost half the audience, right? So everyone has this ability. It's just that we don't use it and trigger it. And spirits all have that ability too. So they just tell the psychic what it is. Right? It's all pretty standard stuff really in the end, right? Scotland 
And as a result of both those readings, um, I was extremely angry with my daughter for probably a year. Right. Um, but my dad told me that I killed my children. I suffered the most incredible guilt for hundreds of years. Why did you get a close to the death? All right. What, why they came through? What was the question? Um, uh, it's very hard to repeat. Um, there were two experiences that you've had. One experience was that uh, they were both related to your children, really, where you were told that there were past life interactions between your children and yourself that you then experienced some very severe emotions about. So that's basically an overview of the question. What actually was happening is here's yourself full of different emotions. One of those emotions was guilt, right? But there's other emotions, right? Here's some spirits. When you go to a far past life regression therapist, there are literally thousands of spirits surrounding that therapist. Thousands. All waiting to tell their story to somebody. Because nobody in the spirit world is listening. And so what they do is they want to connect to somebody who will listen, right? Haven't they got anything better to do? Sorry? In the spirit world, isn't there anything better to do than just hang around people? <laughs> there is lots better to do, but if you're immersed in the emotion, it's very, very hard to do anything other than what the emotion is dictating. Isn't that the case? How do you find it in your own day-to-day -day life? If you're immersed in the emotion, it's very hard to do anything else as well as being immersed in the emotion, isn't it? You don't find someone else attached to them, do you? You often do here on Earth. Honestly, the majority of you at some point have attached to other people just to get an emotion from them. Really? That's where the saying comes from, misery loves company. Exactly. Yeah. You know, why do, like, you know, I was talking with Mary the other day about sometimes a group of women getting together to actually have a lot of negative comments about their partners or ex-partners, right? What's that about? None of them want to deal with the emotion, they all want to commiserate. Right? You get a lot of guys go down the pub, you know, have a bit of a drink and away they go about whatever is happening in their life. Why? Because, because it's a, a law of attraction event to help expose their emotion. But instead of exposing it, they live in it. Yeah. Professional public speakers take that. Sorry? The professional public speakers take that to an extreme. Oftentimes, yeah, because a lot of people do public speaking to get all these wonderful emotions from the audience. Yeah. So even as a public speaker, you've got to be very careful that you're not sucking your audience dry. How do you feel when you walk out? Do you feel like enlightened or bright? Or do you feel like sucked <laughs> right out? You know, it depends on the emotion coming from people. But let's get back to this question that you asked, because it's important. These spirits had these experiences where that you have related. Some of them where, you know, a mother did kill the child or vice versa. <coughs> did kill her children in one case. Right? So this spirit killed her children. She has a lot of guilt about it. You go to a past life therapist, right? past life regression therapist, with your guilt about being a bad mother. She feels attracted to you and comes through you to talk about what's actually happened to her. Now all of that's fine up until this point really. She's working through the same emotion you're working through. Isn't that great? Like it's a friend working through similar emotion. So far it's great. However, when it gets messy is when you're told that you did that, right? now that starts to get very, very complicated. You can stay in these emotions for a long time. Now, if you had focused on feeling your own emotion, you would have probably dealt with it quite rapidly if you understood what was going on. But what happened was your own guilt was so strong and you couldn't allow yourself to fully experience it. And that caused a permanent attraction. attraction. This spirit followed you around for a year and stayed with you all that time. And you felt not only your own guilt, but hers as well in an effort to get to a point where you both had cleared it. But if you knew that was happening, you probably would have dealt with it all within a week. And this is the problem, is when we then assume it's a past life, we have a tendency then to just fo not focus on the causal emotion and release it. No, she wasn't malicious at all. Yeah, she didn't feel malicious. What she was doing was damaging, but she didn't feel malicious. Right? 
but it only became damaging because the past life <coughs> regression therapist said this was you. Because of the belief. Yeah. 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 If the belief had been, this spirit's with you, she's got guilt, you've got guilt, law of attraction happening, talk to each other, you might trigger each other emotionally, and, and you know, that could have happened quite easily. Um, where it'd be like, it'd be like two people feeling guilt here on earth, talking about their own guilt to each other. And you could have dealt with it very, very rapidly. But what happened, it gets all complicated, past life, all this guilt, and now she's permanently connected with you until this guilt's released and it can be a very, very uncomfortable experience. And it is a very uncomfortable experience for the majority. Um, yeah, I'm a bit confused. Um, so as we think of grace and going to more higher dimensions and get rid of our emotions or the dimensions, are we given the ability to connect with spirits generally? Because that doesn't sound attractive to you as all these lower spirits. It's fantastic. But they're all coming to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, they don't. No, no. Like, I don't find them annoying. I don't find them annoying. Well, because it's a joyous experience. They've come to me. My law of attraction brought them. There's something within them that I can learn from. There's something within me they can learn from. I can talk with them, work all that through that, work through it emotionally. They'll leave. You can too. It's just you're not aware. It's not a negative experience. It only becomes negative when our belief system is that we're afraid of spirits. I view a spirit the same as I view you. And that is, we have a law of attraction. If you come up and bop me in the nose, I've got a law of attraction that I attracted it, and I need to look at that. I need to look at what's going on inside of me. You're my, it's that old saying, you're my teacher. And that's happening all the time, constantly. Constantly. It's a beautiful thing, actually. I find it very beautiful. And I've had many times in this life where spirits have been attached to me or attracted to me because of some really severe negative emotions. So I've had whole groups of, of spirits who were really angry come to me. Like, very recently, I had nearly, over a million spirits with me, angry with me. Like, so... So I had to look at the law of attraction. Why am I attracting this angry, this angry spirit? It's all just hammering me. So I just cried. I just let myself cry for six or seven days. Once I did that, they all went away. Because I dealt with the emotion that caused the attraction. So everything's helped, really. Even though they're not, they didn't want to help me. <laughs> but that's how it turned out. Um, recently I had with the spirit that identified himself as my guide. Yep. And the channeling, if that's what we call it, yep. the impression of the words came in several languages. And uh, it was an uplifting experience. It was? Yes. Yep. The communication wasn't something that I previously had a knowledge of or understanding. But because I'm aware of my own soul condition, that I've still got bits of stuff to work through. Mm -hmm. What concerns me is two things. Mm -hmm. How do I place, how do you say, value or truth on what's being communicated? Yep. And second, how do I then uh, be in the best it was a wonderful experience, but what concerned me was whether it mixed my emotions in what you're worried about, processes and, do you understand? Totally. What you're worried about is, was this spirit who was talking to you really your guide? Oh, here's you, here's the spirit. Was this spirit really your guide? You already know the answer, actually. Was it really your guide? What do you feel? What's the you think it was? But let's go with your feelings. What do you feel? Okay. I guess if I am questioning it, then it can't be right. 
Yeah. yeah, so it was a spirit in not a bad place coming to you, claiming to be you. Sorry? Yes, because he knows that's the terminology you use for it. Yeah. But like I was talking to a friend of mine a few weeks ago. He said there's two spirits here from the 22nd sphere. Okay, are you? Um, they're both women. Oh, interesting. Okay. Is there any women in the 22nd sphere? Is there any men in the 22nd sphere? No, not as 21st. 22nd sphere, remember I said, I've said to you, is the soul union condition. So, will you feel the spirit from that location as a gender? No. No. Okay. Interesting that they told him that that's where they were from. Anyway, we started talking to them. Through him, he, he talked to them. And I started talking about their emotions. Their emotions were, they were attached to this man because he, he looks after women, this man does. And they felt attracted to him. Because, why do you reckon they were attracted? Because they wanted looking after. Right? And I actually talked to them. And eventually, we talked, and they were in the first sphere. But they used all the terminology they could to, because they can read his mind, of course. They used all the terminology they could to convince him they were in the 20 seconds speed. But if he allowed himself to feel his emotions, like I did at the time, he would have known they were attracted to him for reasons that wouldn't be there if they were in the 20 seconds speed. Right. But isn't the loving thing to do to hear, is to hear that person out, hear totally. that person out, and then to get them to believe that But let's, let's call it as it is. They're lying to you, misrepresenting the truth to you, so let's address that with them. So let's you need to address that with that spirit. Now, why does it want to misrepresent the truth to you? What's going on? Can you help him? Trust your own feelings about the matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, what was next? Here you come to next on psychics and mediums channeling information from spirits about past life memories. Yep. This one is people having an instant emotional connection other people have not previously met. Alright, how many of you have had an instant emotional connection with other people you've never met? Alright. And how many of you then, from the spirit, from the viewpoint of reincarnation, thought, must have met them in a previous life? Yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose in a way you met them from a previous life. Well, not really a previous life, but every single time you go to sleep, you are now in the spirit world. And you have lots of interactions in the spirit world every single night you're asleep. Lots of interactions. Right? And many times you're setting up meetings for people that you, know, that you want to meet on earth and you're setting up to be in certain places, certain times. You can do all sorts of things in this state. Which when you wake up, you're often not conscious about. But some of you are, right? Some of you are conscious that these are actual events. So what happens is you meet them in up there, you meet them in the spirit world, right? have a great rapport, you really get along great. So, what do you do? You set up a meeting in your awake state. Right? And lo and behold, that meeting occurs in your awake state. And what are you going to feel? I know this person. And the answer is? You do. It's quite simple. Sorry, I'm is a person you're meeting is, is, a, is a... Is a person you're well. materialized spirit, is that real person? Yeah. And both of you, when you're asleep, meet in the spirit Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And this happens all with every single night. Are they random meetings? Sorry? Are they random meetings? Some are random meetings, just like they would be here on Earth. Others are planned meetings where you meet them through a friend, through a friend, you know, and things like that. That all happens just like it would here. Yeah. And it's great, actually, because it lets you set up things. Many of you I've already met, in, I met in the sleep state before I met you here. You know that, many of you. Sorry? Uh, yes, by the way, when you're up in this state, oftentimes you are predicting things in the future. You can feel things in the future. And so you know you're going to be in a certain place at a certain time, and then you have this deja vu experience when you're there. Take notice of them, because they mean something to you. Right? Just take notice of them. This is something. Something's going on. There. Something's telling me. Something's reassuring me. Then I'm on the right path here, you know. I'm, I'm doing what I planned to do when I was in the sleep state. 
AJ, how come we can't remember or a lot of us can't remember? Uh, mostly because of fear. If, if you could remember... I've got a pad beside my bed with a pen, ready to write it all down. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. Deal with your fear. Deal with your fear about the spirit world, your fear about knowledge. <coughs> Many of you are afraid of the things you've seen in the spirit world. Many of you have seen grotesque faces in the spirit world, for example, which are the faces of spirits who are in dark conditions. And many of you in your awake state are afraid of that. So let yourself deal with those fears. I don't feel I'm in fear. I know you don't feel it, but, the, but your law of attraction is proving to you there's an issue. So go with it. See, if I'm not remembering these experiences, then my law of attraction is saying to me, all right, there's a reason why I'm not remembering these experiences. If you want to, deal with the emotions in that. So if the emotion is, I'm not remembering, I'm feeling frustrated, go with your frustration, go into your anger, go into the rage. You know, let yourself follow that thread down the rabbit hole into your emotion that is actually being triggered by your not remembering. Can you connect with somebody, like go to bed, Yep, totally. You do that all the time, don't you? <laughs> How many times in a day do you think, I want to chat to such and such? Right? And the very next moment sometimes, who do you get a call from? Yeah. Exactly the person that you were just thinking of, right? Why did that happen? Because there's this whole thing going on, right? Can spirit take your dreams away? Uh, a spirit can't take away things from you with regards to dreams. Uh, no, it, you do that through your own choices, through their own, your own fears, actually. Dreams, remember I've talked about dreams, two, two states of dream is it's either a real event in the spirit world or it's a law of attraction dream helping you address an emotion. It's like one of those two things. Uh, let's move on to the next point because it's already called the six. You've already mentioned deja vu experiences and near-death experiences. Alright, near-death experiences, very similar. Whenever you're in a near-death state, your spirit, body and your soul leaves your material body. So now you're in the spirit world, able to do things. For example, look down on your own body, which is why most people have that experience. You can also connect with spirits in all sorts of different places and often do. And because you're in a near-death state, you often have a memory of it when you return because it's not a sleep state. Right. So you don't have the same fears. You have a different set of fears generally in the near-death state. Um, but you don't have the same fears as you would in the sleep state remembering. So you often remember them. And that's why lots of people remember near-death experiences, which are all real spirit events mixed with a little bit of lack of you know, oxygen in the brain and a few other things that occur in physiology which may, which may mix, mix up the entire experience. So the light at the end of the tunnel is, is real, is true? Yeah. yeah that, that story. Yeah, the reason why it's a tunnel is there's what you would now, you know, the term you use now is wormholes, right? From a scientific, scientific point of view. There's, there's an interstellar boundary between this dimension and the first sphere dimension. And as you're travelling through that dimension, it's like a tunnel with a light at the end of it. Does that make sense? And that's how you will experience in the future much of your travel in the spirit world. And, and, and people, people are waiting for you at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Yeah. Waiting for you to disconnect from your body and actually make that journey. But Frank Packer didn't see the tunnel. Some oh, sorry, not Frank, Kerry. Kerry Packer. Yeah, a lot of people won't see a tunnel. Some some actually have heard of Howard Storm. He actually went into a state where there were lots of evil spirits around him who 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 tortured him, actually, due to his soul condition. It's worth reading that book too. But none of this is to frighten you. This is all just to tell you that these are just people, right? This is all not to frighten you. Right. Hey Jay, I, my experience was that I actually went into the love. Could you explain what that might be about? Yeah, even in the first sphere, um, what happens is there's a place in re of reception that we all go to generally when we pass, particularly if we've not got a consciousness of the spirit world. 
what happens is, in the spirit world... Did you see Peter Lee with the gates? <laughs> uh, no, he doesn't want that job. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a quote from him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like standing in one place very much. But never has, actually. Anyway, let's say you pass, you're, you're in the process of this near death, which is really a passing sort of process. This is an experience that is very similar to a passing experience. The first sphere, there's a place of reception at the top of the first sphere, which is very bright, much brighter than there from a, from a light perspective. And it also is full of love because there's lots of coming and going there, and there's lots of spirits of a very high quality there, waiting for people who pass, right? And what they're waiting for people who pass, and what they do is they nurture them in that state until they're ready to face their own emotional condition. All right? So you will actually see that as, a, as bright light, but also a feeling of euphoric love, which is actually coming from these spirits, right, to help you through the process of potentially passing. And, and so that's why many people describe this euphoria which causes them to no longer have fear about death. And, and in fact, you have nothing to fear about death because all of you will be welcomed by somebody in the spirit world. Now, whether you accept that welcome or not, for many of the spirits who are here still with us, many of them never accepted that welcome. They were so churned up with their own emotions and so churned up in their own fears that they wouldn't allow themselves to see anything. And what they need to do now is allow themselves to see the spirits that surround them wanting to help them. And you can do that just by desiring it in your heart. And then you'll feel it. Does that make sense? Mm. Really quite simple. Again, the, the problem with a lot of these untruths is they're so complicated, but the truth is so simple that if anybody understood it, they'd progress so rapidly that there'd be hardly any negative experiences with death. There'd be hardly any fear of death on earth at all. And how much of our fear of death causes other choices for us on earth that we wouldn't normally make if we didn't, weren't afraid. So it's, a, so it's a problem that just compounds. Excuse me, Andre. Have I answered this question? Yes. 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 I was going to say, when people are in hospital and they're dying, yep. they often just sort of go in and out of consciousness. Yep. They're, they're likely to say to the relatives around them that relatives of the past are waiting. They can see them in the room. Yeah. What happens is, uh, in the, when a person is passing or in a hospital, usually there are lots of spirits around them in the hospital room with them. And they're all waiting for them to go through this process. Some of them feel they're going to pass or they might just help them to stay. There might be other emotions going on that cause the attraction. But yes, there are often lots of people uh, surrounding that individual waiting for them to pass. And even a person on earth who doesn't have any friends and no family, often has lots of spirits around them at the time of passing right, who are looking after them and caring for them. And there's a lovely experience of that in, uh, I think it's called, I think it's the first book, Through the Mist of R.J. Uh, there's a lovely experience of that with, children, with the children. Or it might be the gate of heaven, but I can't. It's one of those three books. <coughs> okay, how are we doing? I haven't got the real reincarnation yet. Yeah. 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 Sorry? More positive stuff. <laughs> the thing is, the reason why this is dri driven a lot by some spirits at the moment, who are still feeling a lot of their negative emotions, right? So, um, I'll definitely finish at six, so that gives me ten minutes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> The real reincarnation, let's just mention it. Spheres up until the 7th, and then there's the 8th, and then there's lots up there. Let's call it the 22nd sphere. Is it there the real reincarnation only can occur from that location. When the soul reaches its soul union state, it's actually together again. When it's together, it now is able to reincarnate. Until that time, the soul, the half of the soul, is encased in a spirit body form. And a spirit body form cannot reincarnate. It's that simple. 
It's like trying to stuff a spirit body into another spirit body. Because remember, when you are born, two bodies are created. Spirit body, and there's a physical body. Alright? Physical body. Or material body. Now, the soul, the half of the soul is attached to that. Now, when it passes, the half of the soul is still attached to the spirit body. And that remains until the 21st sphere state. To the state pre the union state. And once the union occurs, now the soul is able to reincarnate. It's able to have a connection to other bodies, if you like, at that state. Now, until you reach that state, you will never be able to reincarnate. And when you think about it, it's quite beautiful because. It means that nobody can reincarnate who can damage people on earth. Even more. Can you see that? Because by the time you're in this state, you are in such a condition of love, you're at one with God, how could you damage anybody on earth anymore? Can you see yeah. that? And that's the state where you can reincarnate. The process of reincarnation draws emotions from your parents which then get reimpressed upon you which of course are going to cause pain within you <laughs> of course after that point you know but at the point of incarnate reincarnation what i'm saying is the soul is in such a pristine state that it can't damage anything whereas if people were here on earth now imagine if the murderer reincarnated what would he do he would go ahead and murder some more would he not you know, imagine the chaos that would happen on earth when you've got all of these spirits who are in terrible conditions wanting to reincarnate. Can you see it would be a major chaos? Much more than what it looks like at the moment. You know? That's the truth of reincarnation. You don't have to believe it, of course, but that is the truth of reincarnation. And it is loving. It's loving because this soul chooses through free will to reincarnate for only one reason. And that's to live love. Right? Again on the earth. There are other loving things about that teaching. One is that we can progress in the spirit world. So every spirit who is here listening to us today needs to understand the truth and that is they can progress through the spirit world into better conditions of love and more happier states without returning to earth. They do not have to return to earth to clear away what they call their karma or their errors or their things that they did wrong. They don't have to do that. And in fact, it's great that they don't have to do that when you think about it. All they need to do is get some help from somebody in a higher place and they will be helped to deal with all their emotions. It's a beautiful thing, really, when you think about it. So what's happening is you have this consistent help from the spheres above to the spheres below to help people and we've got this consistent help too available to us on earth to deal with all of the stuff that we're living through on earth. And all we need to do is avail ourselves of it. We just need to allow ourselves to actually connect with this help. All of us get helped. Does any of this change, AJ, after 2012? Is that another myth that's been stowed upon us by the week? God doesn't, the universe doesn't change to man's timetables for a start. The 2012 things, there are changes occurring on earth, of course, with the reincarnation beginning in like 1962 and so forth. There are changes that are going to occur on earth as a result of all of these things, which will make everyone far more aware of this. You are a part of these changes, right? Just you learning truth means that you can then teach truth, you can live truth, and that will cause huge change around you, right? So this change will result from the truth being known here on earth. The problem is, is for many years, for, for, for thousands of years now, the truth hasn't been really known on earth, and so therefore we've got this problem where falsehood continues to get taught over and over again. Now the truth is known on earth again, it can be used and utilized as a method of progressing and growing and changing and the earth will change the result. 
There are metaphysical things allocated with 2012. There are mathematical things allocated with that that spirits in the sixth sphere in particular are very interested in. But if you focus on the soul stuff, you'll find that you'll far exceed the development of those spirits and far exceed their understanding. So, sorry, so it's, it's possible to then to skip spheres, is it? And uh, when you say skip fears, on earth we learn different lessons and sometimes the lessons are lessons from higher spheres than what the one we're in. In the spirit world, no, it's not possible to skip spheres. You actually go from one to the other to the other learning different lessons. It's a bit more orderly, I suppose you could say. Here on earth, you can actually learn lessons from the sixth sphere when you're still in the first sphere condition. Does that make sense? You won't be in the sixth sphere from a spiritual point of view until you learn all those lessons. But you can learn lessons from spheres higher. So right at the moment, I've just taught you one thing that is a 20 second sphere lesson. That's this sphere, the thing about the soul union. In other words, you at some point will become at one with your soul mate. Right? And you at one point will become one, the one entity that you were created. That's a lesson from the 20 second sphere. It's an emotional lesson. I've only taught you it intellectually. You will have to experience it before you know it to be true. But it's a lesson that's available there. And one great thing about talking about these lessons is it removes a lot of the fear out of the progression and allows you to look at everything from a beauty, beautiful perspective and from a loving perspective. And creates desire. And creates desire, yeah. How many of you have wanted a beautiful connection with a partner in your life? Like, yeah, yeah, it's, isn't it? Yeah. It's just something that all of us seek at some point, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Now, what God has ahead of you is that you will have that perfect connection in your life. You will. If you follow the divine path, you will have that perfect connection in your life. It's just a matter of dealing with a few little emotions here. Hey Dave, do, at what point do we have guides all the way through that progression? Yeah. Right up into the 22nd sphere. And beyond. Who guides, who guides the, the souls in the 22nd sphere? Well, like, you're not going to like this answer, many of you, but I'm going to say it. And the God guides myself. I have guided many of the people in the 22nd sphere. Many of those who guide the other people in the 21st sphere. Many of those guided the people in the 20th sphere. And so on and so on and so on and so on. So you're the, you're the original guide. And <laughs> you say I'm the original guide. I don't feel that way now. But obviously I'm going through lots and lots of lessons now, relearning a lot of things because of the emotional damage. But that's what's happened in the spirit world, yes. So, so the first person guides the next person and so on. Wouldn't you do that? Yeah. If you were the first, like honestly, if you're the first person in the 23rd sphere, I want to talk to you. Because, in the 23rd sphere I'm talking. Because I want to talk to you because I want to be there with you. Right? It makes no difference whether you or me get there first. What makes the difference is that I want to be there and if you're there, I want your help. So did God so, right? guide, guide you all the way through? Must have. Yeah. And God's done lots of things to, with me to help me get there. Even things where children have told me things that I needed to learn. And it's a matter of being humble and open to learn those things. This is even in the first century, by the way. Like in the first century, the way God taught me was the same way God teaches you. And many times I was taught by a child in the first century. Right? What would be an example? Uh, just to learn to learn to live in their passion. Like one of the things I started seeing as I grew up a little older, you know, I was seeing children living in their passion, adults not living in their passion. That taught me a lot. That taught me that I had to always go back to being that child, live in my passion. Does that make sense? Yes. So I have been taught in the same way you get taught. Right? And if you make it to the 23rd sphere before me, please come and talk to me about it because I want to be there with you. If we now change to the, to the divine love path that we've come from, the natural love path, do our spirit guides change? Yeah. So we have a change over if we've chosen to go that way? Yeah. And you'll find there will be an interim period where sometimes the natural love path guys come back because you want to avoid some emotion and so they come and help you their way, you know, which is the metaphysical way, you know, so you go off and have a new diet and you go off and change that, change that, and then you realise, oh, I'm just getting away from the emotion again. And then your divine love guide can kick in and help you there. 
So it just depends on what your desire is at that moment as to who is actually helping you. If your desire is to run away from your emotion and do it metaphysically, then you'll get help to do that. If your desire is to stay with your emotion and get help at soul level, then you, then your guides will reflect that. Uh, actually, can I, I'll just stop you, sorry. Sorry, Jen. It's one minute past six. And I did say that I would stop at six. Now, I'm happy to stop. Tomorrow, um, I think there might be some questions you want. When we're dealing with anger and resentment and everything tomorrow, you'll see that there are links with spirits through that whole process. So uh, we can cover some of these questions during that informal discussion for those that are there. Thank you very much for your time today, and sorry I've gone over time for those of you.